Animal regulation is another big issue for several reasons. Um, first is that these animals have a very high ratio of body surface area to body mass, um, which means they cool very quickly um, just being exposed to the environment. They have a low amount of insulating body fat to keep them warm uh, is another issue. They also have an a immature sympathetic nervous system, um, so they're less able to regulate vasomotor tone, which would help shunt blood away from the skin and help maintain um, core body temperature. And really, hypothermia is very, very common during anesthesia. It's very common during anesthesia of adult patients, but it's even more common in pediatric and neonatal patients, as well as even just your small patients. And um, there's several reasons. Obviously, in addition to, for the neonate, for example, or the pediatric patient, in addition to the problems with the uh, low amount of insulating body fat and immature sympathetic nervous system, we also are adding on anesthetic drugs, which do have effects directly on the thermoregulatory center. And because of the reductions in uh, metabolic rate and so forth, we do have decreased heat production. I just actually would like to say one more thing about uh, hypothermia and the anesthetics. Um, because the anesthetics also impair vasomotor tone, um, we can also see these patients becoming cold just from that as well. So, so neonatal and pediatric patients get hit twice because, yes, they have immaturity of the sympathetic nervous system and can't control vasomotor tone. And then on top of that, we add on a very vasodilating drug, which will also alter vasomotor tone. And so consequently, we have a much more profound and um, pronounced um, alteration from, you know, a sort of core circulation to a more core and peripheral circulation, which will cool the patient. As far as hypothermia goes, I think it's really important to pay attention to hypothermia in our patients because although, yes, most patients do fine even when they get cold, um, we do have cardiovascular alterations that relate to that. We can see things like bradycardias, um, and these bradycardias will typically be unresponsive to anticholinergics when they're cold. Uh, the patients may become hypotensive, um, and in extreme situations, they may develop arrhythmias. Having said that, from not even just a cardiovascular anesthetic point of view, uh, you know, increased bleeding is apparent. So for the surgeon, uh, this can be an issue. We have poor wound healing. There's impaired immune function. We have slower drug metabolism. Um, and we can have prolonged and poor recoveries. So I think for all these reasons, it's really prudent to try and keep our patients as warm as possible. We're we'll talking a little bit now. We're going to switch gears and move on to the paddock system. We've kind of talked about the respiratory, the cardiovascular, and the thermoregulatory system. Now we want to talk a little bit about the paddock system. Obviously, the paddock system is super important when we talk about anesthesia because this is where most of our drugs are metabolized. But from even a standpoint of not even discussing just the metabol metabolic effects of the liver, um, but also just from a function functional aspect of the liver, um, the liver does have, or these animals have, little glycogen storage, so they don't really have a lot of glycogen to draw upon for the production of glucose in the body, and so these patients are more prone to hypoglycemia, and so really fasting probably should be avoided in these patients um, unless there's good reasons to do it, and if fasting is instituted, we really need to pay attention to uh, blood glucose levels. As far as the actual function of the liver to eliminate drugs, they do have an immature hepatic, microsomal, um, and P450 system, and this is going to slow the elimination of highly metabolized drugs. And a lot of the drugs that we use are quite highly metabolized when we think of things like the NSAIDs and the benzodiazepines. If I were talking strictly of the injectable drugs that we use for um, the induction of anesthesia, a lot of these, actually their effects, the, you know, the anesthetic effects, go away, not because of metabolism, but because the animal redistributes the drug. Um, now, if the animal redistributes the drug into an insufficient volume of tissue and has um, an immature hepatic microsomal system, you could see prolonged uh, recoveries or sort of a prolonged hangover in some of these patients. So, so in the pediatric patient, we definitely think about the fact that they can't metabolize these drugs as well, and so therefore may have greater effects associated with them. If we look at the renal system, not surprisingly, the renal system is also not fully developed, and so it doesn't function the way it should. And if we just think about what the renal system does and what its normal roles are in the body, you know, one is to produce urine and to concentrate that urine to retain or to sort of uh, conserve fluids that we take in. 
In the pediatric patient, they do have a reduction in glomerular filtration rate, um, renal blood flow, and concentrating ab ability. So their urine does tend to be more dilute. Um, they can't concentrate urine as much, which may lead them to become, or more predispose them to becoming um, dehydrated. If the drugs are uh, metabolized to an active intermediate, or if the drug relies on renal excretion um, for cessation of its clinical effects, um, some of those drugs could have prolonged effects. Um, so it really depends on how the drug um, is sort of metabolized and, and removed from the body. Um, one good example of a drug that can be affected by impaired renal uh, function is ketamine, especially in cats. Um, ketamine in cats is metabolized into an active intermediate, um, which requires uh, excretion. And in some cats with renal issues, we will see sort of this hangover effect associated with the use of ketamine. It's not to say all cats will, um, but certainly ketamine is one that's been uh, incriminated. Um, these patients will also be a little bit less tolerant of fluid loads and uh, not as able to regulate their uh, electrolyte levels. So if we look at the central nervous system, um, the central nervous system, and I think, you know, any of those of us who have children will know, the, and through reading about uh, neonatal development, um, the central nervous system is incredible. Um, in the first few weeks um, of life, years of life, if it's in a human, um, but there's a lot of development and synaptic connections that occur uh, very, very early on in development. Um, and it can take, in probably puppies and kittens, it can take six to eight weeks, um, and the peripheral nervous system may take up to a year to become what we call fully developed. One of the questions that's often array, raised, and it's raised both in um, human as well as uh, you know our companion animal species, um, neonatal patients, is what level of consciousness do these patients actually have? What's the level of cortical activity? Um, because it's really the cortex of the brain where we feel pain um, and where pain is sensed. And so there's been a lot of questions about this. And historically, it's unfortunate to say, but there were a lot of procedures that were done on human infants with basically no anesthetic because at the time they didn't believe these patients could actually feel the pain. And so everything that they saw was just a physiological response, um, you know, spinally mediated. Um, it didn't require um, pain or um, analgesic therapy because these patients weren't able to feel pain. And I just want to go into that a little bit more because I think it is a very important concept and it's a bit of a misconception that just because a patient can't feel the pain because the cortex doesn't feel the pain, I think we now recognize that there's a lot of things going on with pain that occur well below the level of conscious recognition. And this is probably one of the reasons that many of us are very, very um, pro-local anesthetic use because we can block these signals from ever entering the spinal cord and the brain, at least not to the same intensity that they would if we didn't block them. So this is just a diagram to re-familiarize you with the pain pathway. And if you remember, now basically what happens when we have a, a painful signal is it's detected down in the nociceptors. It's then taken up um, through peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, where it undergoes modulation and may be upregulated, downregulated, depending upon whether the animal has an analgesic on board, doesn't have an analgesic on board, has other chronic pain issues, and so forth. Um, and there, from um, that area, it's then projected up to, uh, sorry, projected up to the uh, brain, um, and pain is ultimately perceived in the cortex, and that's where we actually have that sensory and emotional aspect to pain, where Yes, it hurts and it feels bad. Um, having said that, in the neonate, one of the arguments is that, well, their cortex isn't well enough developed to actually feel anything or to think. And so therefore, they don't feel pain and we don't need to treat them. I think it's really important to say, maybe, maybe not. Maybe their cortex can't really perceive it as pain the same way you or I would. But there's a whole lot of activity going on lower, below that level of the, of the cortex that will upregulate the pain response in these patients. And in fact, um, there's some evidence now that actually by not providing appropriate analgesic um, in those neonatal um, times when the patient is subjected to pain, that the pain, patient may go on to be, become more painful or more sensitive to painful stimuli later in life. So early um, pain management in these patients and pain management in the neonatal patient is exceptionally important.
So um, I guess I should just go back one slide, one for one minute, and just to sort of iterate, uh, when we discuss pain and pain perception, we talk about pain as the end point of something we call nociception. And nociception is everything that happens below the level of uh, sort of conscious recognition of the pain. So everything that's happening in the periphery, at the nociceptor level, at the spinal cord, up to where the signal is projected into the brain. And we're just going to move to the next slide. And nociception, on the other hand, is uh, is really that activity that occurs below that level of conscious recognition of the pain. And I think it's important to realize that, yes, maybe regardless of whether we think the patient can feel pain, um, perceive pain, it still creates a stress response and we still have consequences of it. Things like the increased sympathetic tone, release of stress hormones, increased metabolic rate. Um, and having subjected these patients, or if we were to subject these patients to this nociceptive activity, um, it can alter the um, central and peripheral sensory processing um, situation. So patients may, again, as I've sort of alluded to, may have an exaggerated pain response later in life. Okay, so those are the major sort of physiological and anatomical changes associated with uh, neonatal patients, and that sort of forms the foundation of where we want to go when we discuss, you know, managing these patients from an anesthetic point of view. We keep all those sort of physiological and anatomical changes in mind um, as we sort of develop our anesthetic plan or our protocols. So one aspect is obviously our preoperative evaluation. Um, I think this is probably something we do every day and are quite familiar with it. And I think most of us would be very familiar with what normal puppies and normal kittens look like during the physical exam. I just make the comments here that yes, heart rates tend to be higher, respiratory rates tend to be higher, and yes, they always tend to have a very distinct abdominal component to their breathing. Um, which then, you know, could be misconstrued and somebody who's not used to looking at pediatrics is perhaps respiratory distress, but this is a very normal breathing pattern in, in, a, in a neonate or a pediatric patient. One of the things I really focus on when I'm looking at these patients is their hydration level. Um, and a lot of that is if the patient hasn't been nursing, if they've been sick, if they've had some diarrhea, they will dehydrate very quickly. So I pay a lot of attention to their hydration. As far as the preoperative laboratory tests go, um, I, a lot of what I recommend and I suggest is do what is indicated based on your clinical findings, your history, um, and the signalment of the patient. Um, diagnostic imaging, as indicated, may or may not be required. Your CBC and biochemical profile may be useful. They may provide valuable insights, um, especially in some of these patients where we don't have a lot of um, information on their sort of history. Um, but it may also not be very revealing in neonates. We may not find a lot of things that are abnormal. And, and so um, I wouldn't rely on it as a crutch to replace my physical exam and uh, my history. For me, in a healthy you know, pediatric patient who's undergoing anesthesia for an elective procedure, my minimum would be a PCV, a total protein, a glucose, um, a BUN as a baseline in those patients. Um, you know, if the, the patient indicates or if there's a reason to assume that I may need more testing, then I'd certainly recommend that. Um, something to keep in mind with the PSCV and total protein in these patients is that it does tend to be a little bit lower, um, and it's not, uh, not surprising to find it lower. And if you have a PCV that's higher than this, you might start suspecting um, the potential for uh, some dehydration. And I just have to point out here, too, that this is the neonate that I'm describing here with the low PCV and total protein numbers. <clears throat> I think I've already mentioned it, but just to reiterate it, that uh, any, all the preoperative laboratory tests won't really replace your um, physical exam and your history, and these are really the foundation of, of sort of our preoperative evaluation.